a collection of Stuart engines and some other nice things. This is the penultimate part of this series. Part 16 and it's a very important part of the job. Modifying the valve linkages to make them work. Removing the cylinders to check the ports and steamways. Grinding and filing the slide valve ports in the cylinder casting so they are the right size. Reassembling the cylinders and correcting the length of the studs. Lapping the slide valves for a perfect seal against the port faces. I have found a universal problem with all Stuart engines that use a rocking lever to operate the valve. It is very difficult using the normal method to get the rocking arms to be a tight fit on the shaft. And quite frankly, the grub screws that are normally used look awful. Where necessary, I would replace these small grub screws with 7BA bolts. I need to shorten four 7BA bolts to all be the same length. And the easiest way to do this is to drill a piece of scrap brass or steel or any sort of scrap material in the workshop and then thread the hole with a 7BA tap. That's what I'm doing at the moment. The holes are not particularly drilled in a line, it's just not important. What is important though is the deburring process. I'm deburring both sides. And the next part of the job is to screw four 7BA hexagon bolts into these holes, making sure they go all the way in. I'm using a nut spinner for this, they don't need to be very tight, tight enough to resist the next part of the operation. Looking at the other side, there are four pieces of 7BA bolt sticking out, and what I'm about to do is cut these off using my bandsaw. And apart from the one that I lost, I ended up with three sections of very short 7BA studding. These could be useful for a future job, so I put them back in the 7BA bolt box. Now in the outer part of the workshop, I'm cleaning up the other end of the bolts where they've been cut on the bandsaw using my one inch belt sander. Here's the plan, there are four rocking arms and I now have four shortened 7BA bolts which I'm going to screw into the holes in the rocking arms and they will hold the rocking arms to the rocker shaft. Before I do that though, I'm going to file flats on the rocker shaft. It's a very simple job and well worth doing. It will help prevent the rocking arms from moving on the rocker shafts. It's best to do this in stages. First of all, file a flat on the short arm, which is the outer part. Make sure you file it as square as possible. I'm using a square needle file, which really does help. This is about halfway through the job, there's a bit more to do yet. The bottom of the file slot needs to be perfectly level. It is really important that these rocker shafts remain at 90 degrees to each other. And to help this along on the outer part only, I'm using some Loctite 603, as well as a shortened bolt. After allowing a short amount of time for the Loctite to cure, I fitted the rocker shaft into the hole. When doing this job it's very important to make sure that the rocker shaft isn't too far into the hole like it is here. I lined up the first rocking arm with the eccentric rod. That automatically told me where it needed to be. Then I marked the position in the centre to file a flat for fitting the second rocking arm. Getting the 90 degree angle is fairly straightforward. As you press the rocking arm down onto the sandpaper, it's held at 90 degrees. And now, after a bit more filing with the square needle file, I have somewhere for the bolt to clamp to. You don't need to use Loctite on this centre part, it needs to be removable. A picture paints a thousand words, and here's the part in position. I didn't shorten the bolts too much, I wanted them to look like bolts in holes, rather than just a hexagon up against the metal. I could have shortened them quite a bit more than I did. It doesn't really matter as long as the bolt is long enough to apply some pressure to the flat that you filed in the rocker shaft. Now I want to have a look at the cylinders. If you've been watching the series you may have noticed that one of the exhaust beats is quiet and I think I may have the solution for this. Look at the width of the inlet ports. These are cast in so they're obviously a bit rough but one is a good bit bigger than the other. Caution, what you're about to see could make a thorough mess of the port face. Practice on some scrap metal first. And once you can control the tool that's doing the grinding, then you can commence doing what I'm doing. 
I didn't have a diamond bit that would go right down into the port, so started the job with this tapered diamond burr and finished it with the needle file. So now both of the inlet ports are about the same size. It's a better situation than I showed previously with the ports different sizes. It's time to pack the glands. I didn't bother videoing this because most of the time all you can see is my hands doing the job and not much detail. I've done plenty of gland packing in my lifetime and the operation is featured very frequently in my videos. Here's one of the steam chests and from this I removed a shredded gasket, I don't know what that was doing there, and also this sort of excuse for what should be gland packing. It occurs to me that maybe the person who assembled this machine kit didn't really understand what the glands were for. I've seen this sort of thing before. It doesn't necessarily follow that the person who built the engine has much idea about engineering, and in some cases, possibly no idea how a steam engine works. From my point of view, I'm really pleased with the condition of this factory machine kit Stuart Twin Victoria because it's needed a lot of work. And so far I've made 16 episodes which are quite good tutorials. Why am I removing the pin from the crosshead? And what is the reason behind unbolting this cylinder? Well, I want to have a close look at it. In the past, not with machine kits may I add, but with castings from Stuart models that have the ports cast in, I've had problems because they were full of casting sand. I have mentioned this in previous videos. Looking for another possible solution for the quiet beats is the reason why I removed the cylinder. I need to poke something through the steamways to make sure they're not full of sand, and the good news is this is not full of sand, in fact there's no trace of any sand. I'm using a piece of quite flexible plastic strip that was part of a draft excluder system on a caravan door. And here I'm checking the other port, which is clear. Before refitting the cylinder, I packed the gland properly using some Teflon coated yarn. As I mentioned earlier, I've done this so many times, I couldn't be bothered doing it on this one. And it also helps to press record on the camera when you're actually doing it. Before reassembling the engine for the final time, I thought it would be a good idea to clean up the faces of the slide valves. To do this, I'm rubbing them on a piece of 1200 grit wet or dry sandpaper, and I'm using WD-40 as a lubricant. This entire series and the other ones that precede it all feature some things that I bought when I went down to Boston in Lincolnshire. Apart from the steam engines, there was a very nice model boat, some plastic kits, and this. An electric, double O gauge, Duchess of Rutland railway engine. And a small plastic man with a shovel by a telegraph pole. Here's the full picture, there's a lot more. It's an entire double O gauge diorama of a Royal Scott train. It fits perfectly on the wall of my workshop and I really do like it. Originally in this glass fronted display cabinet were a couple of diesels pulling the Royal Scott train, but the diesels were the famous LMS 10,000 and 10,001. There's going to be one more episode after this and it will be just the engine running. I won't be doing much talking apart from maybe one or two little tips along the way. This is a clip of the engine running on some very low pressure compressed air. The timing is still not 100%, I have to do a bit more tweaking yet. But now it has four distinct beats from the exhaust and it runs very slowly indeed. It will run a lot slower than this, I'll show you in the next episode. Time for a bit of slow motion. You have to remember this engine is still quite tight. The new crankshaft I made is a very good fit in the bearings. It still needs a bit more running in time or breaking in. That concludes this episode. Stay safe, stay healthy, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my main steam models website and click on the section of the website that says video playlists and by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch and by using the playlists you can actually watch the videos back to back.